Welcome to Chatham Community Church. We are so glad that you are joining us today. Hey, we invite you to worship with us. Set to rule and reign in our hearts again. Increase in us, we pray. Unveil why we're made. Come set our hearts ablaze with hope, like a wildfire in our very souls. Holy Spirit, come invade us now. We and we pray revive this earth. We see your kingdom first. We hunger and we thirst. Refuse to waste our lives for your high joy and prize. To see the captive hearts release the hurt. This earth. Build your kingdom here. Let the darkness fear. Show your mighty hand. Heal our streets and let set your church on fire. Bring your people back. Change the atmosphere. Build your kingdom. Welcome, everyone, to Chatham Community Church Online. Uh, I want to say a special welcome to those of you who are new here with us. My name is Alex. I'm really, really glad that you're joining us. We're especially glad this is your first time ever with a church community, first time with Church Community Online. Thank you. Thank you so much for joining us. What we're all about is really simple, connect people to God, to each other, so together we can engage our world for good. We have the experience of all those things here this morning. We, are, we have wrapped up our Healthcare Heroes push where we were getting break room snacks for our uh, local nurses uh, here at USC Hospital System, and we've been pushing this for like the last three weeks, and y'all have come through in so many wonderful ways. We received over 90 different boxes of granola bars and Kind bars and all these different snacks, totaling over 2,300 hundred servings of food for hardworking doctors and nurses and folks in the hospital. So just want to say thank you so, so much for getting behind this, for being a part of it. You've been so generous. And this invite you to continue to pray for our local hospitals and uh, the folks who are working. Keep everybody so safe. 
good news. Women's Retreat is on again this fall. We're going to be outdoors at the Chapel Hill Carriage House, owned by our very own Brenda Leeper. November 13th, 9 to 4 p.m. It's 10 bucks uh, for a full day of worship, teaching, some crafts, some other things going on. So a great way to connect with God and with other women. So ladies, if you want to go, I invite you to contact Regina Bridgman. Her email address is right there. We will also have live registration at both locations uh, available at both sites uh, for the next several weeks. So November 13th, 9 to 4, mark your calendars and jump in, ladies. Uh, speaking of mark your calendars, we have a 4 Chatham workday. Save the date for October 30th. Our new building's going up. Good things are happening. And uh, we're going to spend a day just getting the space ready, doing a lot of site work, outdoor work, those sort of things. Uh, there'll be things for high-skilled people to do and zero-skilled people to do. So come, be a part of things. We're super excited about the building going up. Things are moving along. There's a, another fresh shot there of the, the building face. Uh, there's good things happening, and we get to be part of making it happen. October 30th, save the date, and uh, come be a part of getting the space ready for our grand opening, hopefully uh, sometime in December, as we round back into worship, we want to invite you, those of you for whom this is your church home, to make offering a part of your worship. That giving financially and giving generously is part of what it means for us to honor the Lord with all that we have and all that we own. So uh, if this is not your church home, we don't want you to feel any pressure or obligation to give. But this, this is your church home. We invite you to give and give generously. ChathamChurch.org slash give is a way to do that safely and securely online. And as a reminder, uh, this, uh, this month and throughout the course of the series, we are doing communion every week. It's not something we do all the time, but for this month in this series, we are. So I invite you to go and get your communion elements and be ready for communion. We'll be uh, participating in that together at the end of the message. Let me pray for us as we go back into musical worship. Lord Jesus, thank you for this moment in time, this opportunity to pause, to reflect, to receive you, to, uh, to recognize you, to worship you, and to, to rest in your presence. God, whatever, wherever we are, whatever we're carrying into this moment, you're here, you're with us, and what we want to do is lay our other worries, distractions uh, at your feet, and then come to you open-handed, open-hearted, ready to receive whatever you have for us. And now, Lord, we also want to offer you worship, offer you songs of praise and thanksgiving. We pray that you capture our hearts and our imaginations and awaken us to the wonders of your great love. We pray in Jesus' strong and mighty name. Amen, amen, and amen. blood and righteousness I dare not trust the sweetest frame but wholly lean on Jesus name on Christ the solid rock I stand all other ground is sinking sand all other ground is sinking Covenant his blood support me in the warming flood. When all around my soul gives way, he then is all my hope and stay. On the rest the solid rock I stand, all other ground. Oh, may I then 
keep my eyes above the waves when oceans rise my sorrows in your embrace for i am yours and you are mine we believe in god the father we believe in jesus christ we believe given us new life we believe in the crucifixion we believe that he conquered death we believe in the resurrection and he's coming back again we believe in god father we believe in jesus christ we believe pray with me. Heavenly Father, we thank you, God, for all that you are and all that you have done for us, God. You sent your only son down to earth to die for our sins, Father, be resurrected and lifted high. We praise your great name, God, and we thank you for all that you are. In your name, amen. Well, again, I want to say welcome to everyone uh, who's joining us, especially if you're new here. Uh, we're so, so glad that you're joining us, especially if it's your first time ever with a church, church online. Thank you. Thank you so much for being here and being part of our community. And uh, what we're all about is really simple. Connect people to God, to each other, so together we can engage our world for good. We've experienced a lot of all those things here this morning. This is week three of our series called For Now, Forever. And as just a quick reminder, we're doing communion all throughout the course of October, every week of the series, because the things that Jesus is talking about are so synced up with taking communion and enjoying that. So make sure to go get your elements at some point, and uh, we'll be doing that at the end of the message. The, the, the thing that's driving this whole series is that 99.99% of the things that occupy our mental and emotional space is like things for now, right? Schedules, logistics, running kids around, scheduling uh trips, work projects, school projects, relationships, challenges, uh, all the things of the for now life. And those things are so pressing and they're not all bad. There are many good things, but what can happen is even if we're a God person, they can begin to feel like, we can begin to act like this is all there is, that the for now life is all there is. And adding to that is especially the fact that we've been in what I think is probably the most sort of cr uh, crisis-oriented time, the most stressful time of, uh, in a couple of generations for the last 19 months. All over the globe, people have been feeling the stress of the for now situation. And what happens with stress is it kind of really screams at us, this is urgent, this is urgent, this is urgent. And if we're not careful, we can habituate this whole perspective on life and reality that the things of this world for now are the most urgent, most crucial. And the spiritual stuff, it's nice if you can get it. It's okay if it's kind of works for you in the background, if you got time for that sort of a thing. But that doesn't really have anything to do with the real crisis and the real challenges right in front of us. But Jesus says the exact opposite is true. Jesus says all the things that feel so urgent, so kind of impinge on us and cry out and scream at us for attention. He says those things are passing, fading, and secondary. And if we attach our lives to things that are passing, fading, and secondary, we live lives that are then passing, fading, very ordinary. And on the other side, if we instead embrace the invitation of Jesus to put God's forever things first, he says those things are enduring, those things are strong, and those things are eternal. And if we attach our lives to those things, if we 
push through the things that are crying out at us and sort of instead lift our eyes and our hearts and our spirits up to the forever life of God, if we hook into those things, then we begin to live lives that are strong, enduring, and extraordinary. That's the invitation from Jesus, is that we would enjoy the for now, experience the for now, not dismiss the for now, but lift our eyes up to God's forever kind of life. There's the for now life, the forever life. They're not at odds. They can be integrated, but we have to let God teach us how to integrate them. And so we're spending this month of October as Jesus works with one crowd to help me, that, and he meets them in the for now things that they need, but then he calls them kind of beyond being stuck in merely the for now life. We're in John chapter six, the very beginning of John six, Jesus feeds 5,000 hungry people with five loaves and two fish, a very for now kind of a need. You're hungry? Here's food. After that was week one. After that, Jesus uh, realizes the crowd wants to make him king by force. They want a for now king to deal with for now problems, but Jesus has come to establish an, an eternal kingdom. And so he doesn't want a, to be a for now king. And so he sort of evades the crowd and then he dismisses his disciples. It's night. He sends disciples on across a lake. The disciples, last week we looked at this, they bumped into a nasty storm and Jesus comes walking out to them on the water in the midst of the storm. We talked about the, the challenge of being in a crisis and the goal is not, the, the work in a crisis is not to row harder, but to pause long enough to let Jesus on board your boat and then do whatever he tells you to do next. So the story we're picking up today is Jesus just the day before fed the 5,000 and then the, the crowd wakes up the next morning and they realize Jesus isn't there anymore. They, he's gone. And so they go chasing after Jesus around the lake and uh, to the other side and they come looking for him. And, and, and what Jesus is going to challenge them with and challenge you and me with today is this. He's going to say, listen, I know that you love the blessings of the for now life, but I'm, I'm going to, I'm going to, challenge you. I'm going to implore you to move beyond the blessings to, to, to receive those things, but then to also recognize they're there to point you to something bigger, to not merely settle for the gifts of for now, but to recognize that those gifts are there to draw us into God's larger life, a life that is hooked into God's forever eternal life. That's going to be the challenge that Jesus is going to present in the crowd and you and me as we pick up in John chapter 6. Again, Jesus, just the day before, fed 5,000. They wanted to make him king. He kind of pulls away from them and withdraws. The next morning, they wake up and they come looking for Jesus. They find him on the other side of the lake, and here's how the interaction between Jesus and this crowd begins the day after. When they found Jesus, that crowd found Jesus on the other side of the lake, the crowd said to him, Rabbi, when did you get here? Jesus answered, very truly I tell you, you're looking for me, not because you saw the signs I performed, but because you ate the loaves and had your fill. Do not work for food that spoils, but for food that endures to eternal life, which the Son of Man will give you. For on him God the Father has placed his seal of approval." Well, with uh, four teenagers and the phase of life that I'm in, I am in cycling through teaching people how to drive, teaching teenagers how to drive. It's a little bit harrowing and maddening and wonderful all at the same time. So far, so good. One's fully licensed out and about. The other one's got her permit. We'll get her full license in January. I got one working right now, like uh, on driving one queued up on deck. And so the one that's working right now, uh, we go occasionally on Saturdays to Northwood High School to drive around. She's doing great. But as a public service announcement, if I were you, I would avoid Northwood parking lot on Saturday. Just saying. Now, one of the things as you're working with drivers is, you know, it's one thing to get them comfortable behind the wheel and kind of, you know, kind of learn the, the ropes, but it's another thing for them to learn like all the other rules of the road, right? And particularly around signs. I mean, some signs are obvious, right? The speed limit, that's easy. Like a yield sign, that's fine. Some signs go out of their way to communicate to you what they're trying to say, as in this one, which says, please, 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 please stop, please, please stop. So they're, you know, working out, uh, that's an obvious one. But other ones aren't quite so obvious or intuitive as to what you would do or what they mean, right? So Take this time, for example. I, you know, I just sincerely hope that your car is not headed for that kind of, uh, of a water event, but I can't quite imagine how that would happen. Like, where would you need to see this? The other, one, the other thing that I don't like is signs you can do nothing about. So for this one, if a cow is falling on your car, what is one supposed to do about the fact that a, a cow could potentially be falling onto your car. There's signs, but then there's signs. And there's some signs that are more intuitive or more obvious what they mean than others. And if you don't understand the sign, then you're not going to take the right action, what you're supposed to be doing. Jesus says, 
to this crowd that's coming from the other side of the lake who's just saw him feed 5,000 people. He's saying, listen, you're looking for me not because you saw and understood the sign, but just because you had some food, some bread. Jesus says, listen, this was a sign that I gave to you, and a sign always signifies something beyond itself. There's always an action to do or not to do, right? Something to, uh, again, a speed limit, a stop, or it's a sign that points to something, a destination, right? Like the beach, 10 miles away. The point is not to stop at the sign. The point is, you want to go to the beach? That's how far you've got to go to get there. Signs are given to us to follow them to the thing signified. Jesus is saying to this crowd, I gave you this miracle. You're excited about the miracle. You love the miracle, but you just want to camp out at the miracle. You're not seeing the sign for what it is. and You don't understand that the point of the sign was to point you to something larger and deeper and more important. You just want to camp out at the sign. More bread, more bread, day in and day out till you have your loaves and eat your fill day in and day out. Out. You're missing what I'm actually trying to tell you. My, uh, my parents were up last weekend. My mom is a hospital chaplain and uh, she works with, you know, a lot of sick people. And she tells stories about, last weekend she was telling me stories about people uh, that she will sit down with who tell her I should have died stories, right? Uh, uh, not every day, but lots of the patients are like, man, I should have died. I could have died. Like I, I didn't even know I had this medical problem and the doctor accidentally found it or I was in this accident and I should have died, could have died, but man, I didn't die. Well, how wonderful is this? And some of them have a series of I could have died and should have died kinds of stories. Now, Many of them attribute their life uh, saving experiences to God. Like, hey, God, God saved me. This is a miracle from God. God must have a plan for my life. Those kinds of things are said by people, particularly here in the South, who have experienced sort of near death experiences. They should have died. Uh, and, and, as, as my mom talks to these people, she was telling me, it's, it's pretty obvious that faith actually isn't a part of their larger life. Like there's nothing else about their life that seems like faith is integrated in any meaningful way. But they're able to give language and give words about God and God saving and God has a plan and all these sorts of things. Now, my mom has many, many gifts. The, one of the major ones, though, is the gift of bluntness. Some of you have this gift. Some of you know someone who has this gift. And my mom will ask first, hey, are, you know, are you a Christian? If you start talking about God, are you a Christian? Because not everyone she works with is a Christian. If they're not a Christian, she'll sort of let the God talk pass and just kind of play through and be respectful, that kind of thing. But if they say they are a Christian, and if they've told her about a series of I should have died kinds of stories where God saved them, my mom will ask this rather blunt question. So last time this happened and God saved you, did anything change? Did you do anything different with God or with your life on the other side of that experience? Nine times out of 10, they're like, no, not really. Nothing really changed about my relationship with God or any other part of my life after that experience. Some of them ask another rather blunt question. So you say God must have a plan. Do you have any idea what that plan might be? And often nine times out of 10, it's like, no, I'm not real sure what I'm here for, why God saved me, what God's plan might be. And then she'll say, and then she'll say something like, if you know Jesus, you know exactly what God's plan is. You need to make some changes. You need to follow Jesus. There's the sign, the rescue from near death, right? And they call 911, they, call, they, pray, they cry out to God, and then God miraculously saves them, and they're able to articulate, man, God saved me. God did this wonderful miracle. But they don't see the sign, the invitation to a deeper life with Jesus. Once the crisis is over, back to life as usual, apart from God, disconnected from God, they don't understand that this whole thing is a call to a life of faith, hope, love, repentance, life change, surrender to God. An integrated life of prayer and faith community and scripture and becoming an instrument of God's kingdom coming, God's will being done on earth as it is in heaven. Complete life change is the invitation on the other side of God's miracles in our lives. Now, here's the thing. You don't have to have a near-death experience to miss the signs of grace, do you? Like, signs of grace are all over the place, and we just blow through them, miss them, right? The, the beauty of nature, a great conversation with a friend, a job opening coming open, a medical situation sometimes is helpful, the right conversation, the right person at points along the way. There's all these experiences of grace, a, a, a sweet moment with a, a small kid or a child. There's these moments of grace that we just miss. We were talking about this in small group this past week. Why do we miss these experiences of grace, these signs of God's invitation to worship, to trust, to delight. And one person said just busyness, right? Just get so busy kind of missing things. Another person pointed out that, hey, if what you believe to be true is going to affect whether or not you perceive the signs of grace. Like if you don't believe God's at work, you'll believe God at all or that God works in the world, then of course, when grace comes your way, you're not going to see that as a sign of grace. You're going to think of it as luck or random. And another person pointed out, hey, you know what? If, if you have an idol in your life, if you're worshiping another God, then 
yeah, this, you're not going to see grace. You're not going to see the signs of grace. And, I, and idolatry is a way that we miss God. Remember our definition of idolatry around here, right? An idol is taking a good thing, attempting to make it an ultimate thing, often resulting in disastrous things, right? So the woman who was saying that, she works as like a pediatric surgeon. She works with kids, helping kids to have better lives. You can't get any more noble or virtuous than that. That's a good thing. But if she made it an ultimate thing, an idol... It could result in disastrous things, like so many doctors whose marriages and families are complete train wrecks because they built their whole lives around their noble calling, good calling, make it an idol, make it a god, it undoes all the other important things. If we have idolatry in our hearts, our hearts grow callous. We go tone deaf to the signs of grace coming at us, inviting us to trust in God, know God. You don't have to have a near-death experience to miss the signs of grace in our lives. Some of us still have the language, some of us still have the words about God, but we don't have the intuition and the sense of what it means to actually step in, to press into God as he invites us to follow signs into a different kind of life. So Jesus meets this crowd, eager for more bread. He says, don't work for food that spoils. Don't work for food that is just going to pass. What work for food that endures to eternal life, which the Son of Man is going to give you. About 20 years ago or so, I was sitting in a summer school theology class. So we're talking like seven hours of lecture a day for like five days. It was just like a kind of a bulldog kind of cram into theology. I had a great professor, loved him. And every so often he would go off on these little soapbox rants that were part wisdom, part hilarious, and often very insightful. And I remember one morning as I was sort of like trudging through and trying to stay focused on the, 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 the task at hand and what he was saying, he went on a soapbox rant. It was a really great one. He, and he landed it this way. He said, at the end of the day, do you want God or do you just want God's stuff? Do you want God or do you just want God's stuff? And I don't think I heard a thing, another thing he said for the rest of the day. I, I went up to the side and I started listening. What are the, I started listing, what are the things that I want God to do? What are the actions, activities, or just the, the things I want from God? And, you know, and so many of them were really good things, right? I wanted God to, to intervene uh, in my ministry. I was new in ministry. I really wanted God to do great things in the ministry. And so, I, so I put that, that's a good thing, right? And, and then my marriage, it was early on and there was some challenges and we were going to counseling. I was just praying, God, would you kind of, you know, bring health and redemption in my marriage. Also a really good thing. And I started listing more and more things. And I realized if this is all my relationship with God's about, it's asking him to do things for me and to give me his stuff, then I can get so hooked into asking God to do things for me or get so hooked into his stuff. Bread that spoils, food that spoils, for now things that are really good but not ultimate. I could so get hooked into those things, I could miss God altogether. And so I did this prayer exercise. I, I listed all the things I was asking God to do. Again, good things I was asking God to do. I said, God, here's the things I want you to do. Here's the stuff I want. It's, I, think it's, I think these are all real good things, but here's the deal. I want you more. I want your character. I want your presence with me. I want to know you. I want to be attending to you so that no matter what happens on this, with this list of things that will come and go, I want to be I want to cling to the rock. I want to cling to what's true, what endures, what is eternal. I want that. And it's been such a great prayer exercise for me to come back to again and again and again. God, here's all the things that I care about. These are good things, but it's all just food that spoils, things that are passing, the for now life that's passing. And what I want instead is I want to hold on to the things that are eternal, the food that lasts into, endures to eternal life. And so this morning I want to ask you what's on your food that spoils list. What are the things you're thinking about, praying about, even asking for? Again, not bad things, good things. But what are the things that are sort of, that you're hooked into? Maybe places where you're working for the for now things instead of, instead of uh, forever opportunities. Where are there things that you're like working for and praying for and asking for, just laboring over food that spoils, things that are passing, fading, secondary, and missing things that are eternal, durable, and make your life extraordinary as you connect with the God who is over all those things. Things. Where might you need to sort of step back from the urgency, the shrillness of the things that are screaming at you and saying, you know what, those things are passing, fading, secondary. That's food that spoils, not all bad things. But the things of God, the eternal things, that's what I want my life to be built around. That's the things I, those are the things I want to respond to, I want to attend to, and I want to engage with. The crowd wants more bread. They want more food that spoils. And Jesus says, don't work for that. I want you to work for things that endure to eternal life. Now, in response to the call to work for food that endures to eternal life, the crowd asks a magnificent question. And they said this, what must we do to do the works God requires? I want to pause here because I think this might be the most important question in any spiritual journey. 
What must we do to do the work that God requires? Almost every religious sort of system or belief system has this idea that, listen, there's God and there's us, there's a spiritual life and there's us, and there's a gap between like us and that spiritual life, that spiritual journey. And there's ways we've got to kind of close that gap, we've got to work that, that gap. And there's also a gap between who we are and who we could be or who we should be. And we've got to figure out ways to close that gap. And so almost every religion, almost every kind of faith practice has things that you need to do or ways you need to kind of close the gap between you and God or you and your sort of the, the, the healthy spiritual version of you and then you and who God made you to be or who you should be. And so, man, even if you're not a particularly religious person, you maybe have heard a, a Christian version of what's the work God requires of you? What are the things that God wants from you? What does God want? If, if there is a God, what does that God want from you and for you to do? This is actually the most important question that you could ask in the spiritual journey. And so you'll see all kinds of Christians answering this in pretty good ways uh, based on the Bible, but almost no one actually pulls Jesus' answer to that wonderful, magnificent question that he gives to the crowd. Here's what Jesus says to maybe the most important question in anyone's spiritual journey. Here's the works God requires. Jesus answered, the work of God is this, to believe in the one he has sent. So, one of the most fun arguments we've been having for like the last 19 months has been about masks. Hasn't that been so fun? Has it been so fun to argue about pieces of cloth over your face and mouth? This has been awesome, hasn't it? Now listen, I'm not going to weigh in on any of this. I'm just going to use this as an illustration. So take a deep breath, get, work out your rant, whatever kind of thing, just kind of whatever button I just push, let it play through, boil over, take a deep breath. Okay, we're not going to fight over masks over this. I'm just going to use this as an illustration. We'll see if this works, okay? What drives whether or not you are willing to voluntarily wear a mask has everything to do with what you believe about the, effect, the eff effectiveness of mask wearing, right? So uh, an, uh, uh, a survey I read uh, from uh, late fall, or, uh, I'm sorry, late summer, early fall, showed that 80% of Americans believe that masks kind of help or definitely help with COVID transmission, right? So if you believe that masks help with COVID transmission, obviously you are going to be more willing to voluntarily wear a mask, right? That's what you believe and that's gonna ex be expressed in a certain way. Meanwhile, 20% of Americans either aren't sure that it helps or are pretty sure it's completely useless. And so of course, if you're one of those 20%, you're not gonna voluntarily want to wear a mask. Your, your belief of, of, of masks, efficiency and usefulness is gonna drive whether or not you wear Anything. So here's the deal. Our behavior masks or not is 100% driven on the rails of what you believe to be true. Here's the deal. Inward belief drives outward behavior. That's what I'm getting at. Inward belief drives outward behavior. Behavior. It's not just true for religious people. Religious or not, everyone is a believer. Everyone is a believer. Everyone's a believer about some, something that is true or not true. Everyone's a believer about so what the best life is, the best life for you is. Everyone believes in some system of belief, of, of, of actions and steps, of what it means for me to be a happy, healthy person getting what I want. Everyone believes in something, and your inward beliefs drive your outward behavior, not just about masks, but about everything, how you spend your time, how you spend your money, what you believe to be true, about what makes you happy, about what you it's your good life or what God wants from you. Inward beliefs always, always drive outward behavior. So when Jesus asks the million dollar question, what must we do to do the works, plural, that God requires because of, his, because of course it's works. There's like 10 commandments, right? So at least those works. And then uh, actually uh, the, the, the ancient Jewish kind of tradition had over 600 commands in the Old Testament, in, the, in their scriptures, uh, things that God required them to do. So what are all the works? Of so all these works, what, like Jesus give us like, I don't know, 10, 12, 15 that we can need to do that God requires of us. And Jesus responds, there is one magnificent work, singular, to believe and the one he has sent to believe in Jesus. Pleasing God isn't about primarily what you do outwardly. Christianity is not about behavior modification. Christianity is not about you doing more good things and bad things and hoping you go to heaven when you die, which is nothing like Christianity, which is not the problem God was solving with Jesus. Christianity is not primarily about do's and don'ts externally because our lives always run on the rails of our belief. Inward behavior drives outward action. And so when Jesus is asked, what's the one work that's most essential to do the work that God requires? The work that's most essential is to put belief in Jesus as your central operating system because whatever you believe inwardly is going to be expressed outwardly in your behavior and in your actions. So yes, as you put faith in Christ, belief in Christ, as you watch and read and study Jesus, and as you begin to see what meant for him to live a magnificent life was full surrender to the Father. If that's what it means to be full, if that, that's, what, that's what it means to be fully human, if that's, what, if that's the Jesus way, and I believe that that's the best way to live, then I too am going to live 
fully surrendered to the Father. If, if Jesus said, hey, here's how this whole thing works. Here's, here's, how the, here's how the human being script works, that you pray, God's kingdom come, God's will be done, then I'm gonna live a life where God's kingdom is coming, not my kingdom. And God's will is being done, not my will being done. In, in me and through me, and sometimes in spite of me, I wanna be a participant as best I possibly can in the Jesus way externally. And there's like a million different applications and implications. Once you get the central operating system of belief in Jesus and following and learning and walking in and practicing, Practicing and practicing and practicing the Jesus way. But it starts with belief. I believe Jesus has been sent by God to redeem, heal, ransom, rescue all of us and to show us what life is supposed to look like if sin was not the thing tripping us up. To show us what it looks like to be fully human, fully alive, to take his teachings, his life, and then to integrate that and implement it into our own lives as we go along. The, the reality is this, my friends. All of us are believers all of us, our lives are gonna be running on the rails of what we believe to be true, right, good, or productive, or good for us in the day. And if you're not sure, if you're not sure what you believe, or don't think of yourself as a believer, just do this, it, it works in reverse. Just look at what you do. When you have choices, what, what, what choices do you make with your money, with your time? What are the things you think about? What are, the, what are the meditations of your heart, the words of your mouth, and the actions of your days? What does it tell you about what you believe? And this is especially helpful for those of us who are Jesus people. Because if you say on Sunday morning that you believe in Jesus, but the whole rest of your life doesn't reflect any of that, what's true in fact, what's, what's actually true is there's a different belief system at work in your life. You are believing some other set of priorities principles or guidance to make your life worth living. You're trusting something else, not in the Jesus way, not in the Jesus system, which is at least a helpful thing to know. And so my friends, inward belief drives outward behavior. And so my friends, when, G when the crowd asked Jesus, What's the th what do we need to do? What are the all the things we need to do to make God happy, to be in good graces with God, to sort of be aligned with God? Jesus says there's just one magnificently wonderful, hard thing that is to believe in the one he has sent to build your life around his, his program, his kingdom, his way, and then to learn how to live into that over the course of your lifetime. There's a book I'm reading that really summarizes this in some really cool ways. This is their definition of what it means to grow up into Christ. It means basically being formed according to the pattern of Christ, the way of Christ, right? Such that each person and community is able to improvise the way of Christ in real life and in real time. See, every generation has to take the truths of the gospel, the good news of Jesus, and find ways to implement it, to improvise. I love that improvising, right? Because there's so much in the Bible that, that is true and good, but that doesn't tell you how to be a, a, a student in middle school. It doesn't tell you how to be a, a, a teacher in a, in a school. It doesn't tell you how to be a, a, a mom or dad in suburbia. There's so much about this that has to be improvised. We have to be learning how to, how to employ it, how to, how to integrate it in real life, in real time, along the way. But we take the way of Christ, and we learn it, and we, we ingest it. We say, yes, this is true. This is right. This is good. I believe that this is showing me the way to be fully human in line with God and the world that God made. And so I want to learn to improvise that Jesus way in real time in my actual life. And so when Jesus is asked, what do I need to do? What's the work? Believe in Jesus and behavior change. It gets improvised, implemented, and worked out in real time. Put that, put that forever good news at the center of your life and then let it kind of begin to work out and tease out what it means to be fully human, how to navigate your challenges, your stresses, your opportunities, one day, one decision at a time with a million different things kind of flowing, cascading from that central, central operating system of Jesus is Lord, Jesus is God's son, and he's the one who's been sent to come to show us the way. Now, belief being the work, that's really good news, right? And it's not a whole list of things to do. It's not as overwhelming. There are, there are things we have to do along the way, but those things are secondary. They flow from the primary work of belief. That's really good news, but it's also challenging news because for some of us, it's so hard to believe, right? For some of us, everyone's a believer. Everyone is believing something, but, but man, for some of us, the whole like God thing and Jesus and life of the spirit, the whole spiritual life is just really, really hard for us to kind of grab a hold of and get our minds around, our hearts around. For the, the honest truth is belief is not equally challenging for all of us, but the truth truth of the matter is at all of us have some point at some point in our lives struggle to believe all of us at some points along the way have challenges to our belief and so what I want to do as we close up this morning is I want to help us to kind of bring some of these threads together to to cultivate hearts that are open to belief today's wildly important take home let's just sort of gather the first thing up first the first thing is this I want to invite you to follow the signs of grace to the ones to the one that the signs are pointing to and to the forever life of Jesus to follow those signs of grace to the one those signs are pointing to, to the, to the forever life of Jesus, to hook into that life, to, to be awake to all the signs of grace that are around you and to slow down, to attend to them, to maybe 
uh, name uh, the idols and let go of the idols that would block you from, from knowing it. Maybe to recognize your own unbelief that would block you from knowing it. But uh, cultivate hearts and minds that are open to the signs of grace, to receiving signs of grace, and then to following those signs, to not be satisfied with the gifts or the miracle, as wonderful as that is, but to recognize, hey, the miracle of fall, the miracle of this wonderful little conversation, those things are pointing me to the forever life of Jesus. Let me step into that as best I possibly can. Second thing I want you to, to kind of cultivate is to rem- and to remember is the work of God is to believe in the one he has sent. That's the work that God requires. That's the invitation from Jesus when he was asked this multi-million dollar massive question, what's the work God requires? We believe, we believe, we believe. Now, as we talk about belief, again, we said that not, every, not everyone is created equal when it comes to belief. For some of us, it's harder. Uh, and, and we can't force it, but, here's, but there are ways we can cultivate hearts that help us to engage with belief. So let me give you a few steps to, to help you engage with belief. The first one is this, to remember that belief is a gift we can't force it, but we can create an environment conducive to it. Later, the Apostle Paul is going to write, listen, uh, faith is a gift from God, not of our own works. We can't be proud. We can't be arrogant. So we can't generate like, belief on our own. But what we can do is, is, is create hearts that are, that are good soil, that once God deposits a little bit of belief, a little bit of faith in there, it can, it can grow and be nurtured. And there's a few things that you can do to help create an environment conducive to it. I'm going to give you a few ideas, and then there's, there's many more you can do, but I'm just going to give you a, a few ideas for how you can create a heart that's conducive to belief. It's the most important work that we could possibly do. The first thing is the stuff to get rid of. Root out pride, cynicism, and apathy. Pride, cynicism, and apathy. I want to invite you just to be aware. What's the proud voice or the cynical voice or the, ap- uh, the apathetic voice? It's in you. It's in me. What do those voices sound like? And can you begin to recognize that those voices are not the path to real joy? They're not leading you down the path uh, that's life-giving at all. Can you be aware of how pride might keep you from hearing the voice of God, from believing, from trusting, from stepping further up and further in to God's kingdom coming and God's will being done in you and in, in your world? Can you be aware of pride, particularly those of us who are religious? Remember, religious pride killed Jesus. Religious pride killed Jesus. Religious pride killed Jesus. And it's so deceptive because you can look very spiritual on the outside. And you can even use the language and, and, and know the right words to say and completely be oblivious and miss the, the work of believing in Jesus. Can you begin to name and identify places where pride or cynicism or apathy is keeping you from receiving the gift of, of faith and belief and, and, and choking it out even if God gave it to you? So you want to root out the best you can, pride, cynicism, and apathy. Name those things. Ask God to deliver you from them. Repent of them. Like I recognize, hey, there's the ways that I feed it in my own heart. There's ways that I kind of I actually uh, stoke the fire and the flame of my own pride or my own apathy or my own cynicism. So God, I'm just going to let go of that and I'm asking you would forgive me and, re- and free me from these things. And then take off those things and then put on uh, a leaning in posture and a willingness to change. Are you willing to kind of lean in, to ask questions when you hit places, especially when you hit places of disappointment, frustration, confusion with God or things aren't going well? Can you lean in and, and, and go to God open-handed, open-hearted? Okay, God, I don't understand what's going on, but I want to turn towards you and lean deeper into the Jesus way. I want to step deeper into the Jesus way. I don't want to settle for just getting through life, skating through life, even skating through disappointments. I want to sort of engage with you. I want to lean in. I want to recognize. I want to, I want to be curious. I want to cultivate that curiosity. How, why is it that the Jesus way has changed more lives than anything else? How is, how is Jesus at work in the situation where I don't see God at work at all? I'm just believing and trusting. He is at work. What, 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 what might I do? How might I be open my eyes to what he's up to and what's happening. Can you cultivate a, a posture that, that leans in and is also willing to change? Jesus, uh, I recognize that I come to every conversation with you, every situation with my own agendas, my own ideas, and I'm not going to hold on to that before you. I'm going to lay that at your feet. And I'm open-handed, open-hearted, ready to follow you wherever you lead me. We can't force belief. We can't kind of generate it. it. It is a gift, but we can't cultivate hearts that are conducive to it, that are open to it. And I invite you to sort of root out the pride, cynicism, and apathy and to put on sort of a leaning in posture, a curious posture, a willingness to change posture before the Lord and see how we might surprise you, how you might be, become more uh, awake to the signs of grace that are coming your way. Well, a crowd chase after Jesus, looking for more bread. And he says, listen, don't work for food that spoils. It said, work for food that endures to eternal life. And then uh, after that conversation, years after that conversation, Jesus is in a small room with his 12 closest friends and he, uh, he's going to do a bread thing again. Uh, he's going to take these ordinary elements and say, hey, th- these things, they are pointers or signs. They're signs to something deeper and greater. And so Jesus does this really delightful thing with his group of 12 disciples. He, he takes ordinary bread and he breaks it and says, this is my body broken for you. 
eat this in remembrance of me. And then he takes the cup and he says, this cup is my blood shed for you for the forgiveness of sins. Drink this in remembrance of me. These signs, these concrete pointers to eternal life, a, a, a body that's broken for you, for me, blood that's shed to wash away all our sin. And so today, as, as you've got these elements in your hand, what I want to do is I just want to invite you into a moment where you reflect on these signs. What, whatever you have in your hand, whatever, whatever elements you have, I want to invite you to take a beat just to see the sign for what it is, to not simply be grateful for the bread, but to be grateful for the eternal life they signify. So I want to invite you here to take a moment to pause, holding these elements in your hand, to reflect on what is this pointing to? What are, the, what are the larger realities and how might you avail yourself, open yourself, enter in to the deeper life of Christ? Take a beat right here with these elements just to pray before the Lord. I'll take a moment to release anything that might keep you from receiving the sign for what it is, whether that's pride or cynicism or ambivalence or idolatry or busyness. Take a moment just to name anything that would keep you from entering into and seeing the fullness of the sign for what it is. Take a beat to pray before the Lord. Jesus said, this bread is my body, broken for you. Eat this in remembrance of me. Eat. Took the cup. He said, this cup is my blood, shed for you for the forgiveness of your sins for now and forever. Drink this in remembrance of me. Lord Jesus, thank you for these tactile, tangible, delightful signs of your magnificent grace, the miracle of grace, of redemption, of renewal for now and forever. Help us to be open-handed, open-hearted, to receive these gifts for all that they are and to walk in the Jesus way, to have these things remind us and call us out of our everyday lives into the magnificent, glorious kingdom that will have no end. We want to live as citizens of that kingdom forever and ever, and we want to walk in your grace and your glory. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen, amen, and amen. We're going to close now, uh, as we always do online, with some discussion questions. I invite you to uh, either talk with a family member or a friend who's there, pull out a journal, get on a phone call, text somebody, or just take a beat to... Uh, push pause and uh, watch and sit with these questions for a little bit. Let me send you these questions and pray as we close. Lord God, thank you so much for your forever kingdom and for inviting us into that eternal life. We pray that you would help us to attend to the forever things. Help us to leave behind the food that spoils, to work for food that endures. Thank you so much for the grace and the invitation. We bless you. We praise you. Holy, holy, holy to the Lord God Almighty, heaven and earth are full of your glory. Amen. Amen and amen.